want to I want to spend a little bit of time kind of coming off of the song that we've just sang and just talk about the love of God. Talk about the love of God. How many know that's a topic you can never exhaust? Right? We, we talk about the love of God forever and ever and ever and keep going and going and going, talking about his love, and we can never fully exhaust that topic. So I want to talk about the love of God. I want to take you to a scripture, actually a number of scriptures. If you have your Bible near you, we're going to flip to a number of different places, and I want to capture what I believe to be the word of the Lord for us today. I want to start in a scripture that is quite familiar, one that I think most of you would know, and, and, but I do believe there might be some here today that don't that don't know. Uh, Betsy, will you find that buzz for me and figure that out for me? Thank you. That's going to drive everyone nuts. They're all looking at me like, why, why is that happening? And um, I want to take you to a scripture that's quite familiar. It's John three sixteen. It says, for God loved the world so much that he gave his one and his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Raise your hand if you're familiar with that passage. You've heard that one before, right? All right. It's profoundly simple. And yet it's simply profound. Friends, if you know nothing of the Bible, if you know nothing of the Bible, start there. Start there. If you think you know everything about the Bible, return there. Like if you think you're one of those folks that's a know-it-all and you just got it all figured out and you've read this thing through a bunch of times, no, go right back to this one. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and his only son. Everyone who believes not some, not a few, everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The declaration is this, that he loved. But this is, dec- this is not a declaration that's just rooted in the past. It's not constrained to the past, as if somehow we have a God who did something out there at some time in history, and we just look back via the word of the Lord, the word of God, the Bible, And we just kind of go, oh, that was cute, what God did back then. He loved the world. No, no, no. He not only loved you and I, but he loves you and I and will continue to love you and I, regardless of what you and I do that's unlovable. At least we think it is. In our own hearts, we feel like we do things all the time. Raise your hand if you're a person who's ever done something that you thought to yourself, God will surely not love me now, right? Things we've thought, things we've done, okay, actions. And yet we believe from the scripture that God not only loved, but he loves and he will continue to love us. The Bible tells us in 1 John, God is love. It actually gives a definition of God. You know, when you actually read things in the scripture that says God is, and then fill in the blank, you might want to pay attention. Right, you may want to look and go, well, God is what? He's love. God is love. And some of you may be wondering yourself, well, what about then the wrath of God? What, what then about the justice of God? What about the righteousness of God? I mean, how do, you, how do you hold these two things in tension? Here's what I want to say to you. I believe for those of you that have wrestled with this, this could be perhaps a helpful, helpful statement, and that is this. The wrath of God, the justice of God, the righteousness of God, none of those things ever void the love of God. I believe they work in partnership. And humans have a very hard time figuring this out. Humans have a very difficult time trying to wrestle through this. We look at this, we say, well, the wrath and the justice and the righteousness of God is over here, and it is is so separated from the love of God. Matter of fact, they never will cross, and that's not true. Humans can struggle through figuring this out, but God has never struggled in figuring this out. He can hold both of them for us. He wants us to be righteous, and he's going to love us. He will have justice, and he loves us. Yes, there indeed is the wrath of God that we read about through the scripture, yet he loves us. The book of Hebrews gives us a a really good, helpful um, kind of explanation for this. It's in chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. It speaks of the discipline of God. I don't know how many of you have ever read this passage about how God disciplines those he loves, and if you ever wanted to like highlight that with a black marker, you know what I'm talking about? You're like, it's like our, one of our least favorite scriptures. We're like, ugh. Because, you know, human, humans like myself, we don't like discipline. We don't like that. But we read in the scriptures that, that the Lord is one who disciplines us, and he disciplines us because he loves us. You take a parent. A parent is going to discipline a child. Now, done properly, okay, it is a very loving act. 
right? We know that we love that child so much so that we want them to be corrected, to be uh, moved in a different direction from where they previously were going. It's out of love. Now, I know, I know in a room of this size, there's going to be stories that can be told of individuals who have received discipline out of spite or out of anger, out of wrath, out of harm. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the discipline of Hebrews chapter 12 that is accompanied with love. God disciplines those he loves. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say this. If he didn't discipline us, it would prove he doesn't love us. But God loves us and he disciplines us. John 3 verse 17, it's a verse we don't often memorize because we've memorized 16 so well. But in John 3 17, it tells us that God's love is not a condemning love, but it's actually a saving love. It doesn't push us away, but rather it draws us near. I can think of when Anna was younger. I don't know if she's in this service or not, but um, regardless, I'll talk about her. But uh, <laughs> when she was younger, you know, you've heard me say, if you've been around this church any amount of time, that, you know, Anna for, is wonderful. She's 21 now, and she leads us in worship uh, once in a while, and, and uh, just a godly young woman. But I'm telling you, she was the fruits of the devil as a young child. <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> It took everything. We were reading every James Dobson book we could on strong-willed children. And, um, and so it took a lot out of us as, as parents. And we grew a lot, obviously. But, but there, was, there was so much um, just energy that had to be expended on, on helping kind of craft who she would become. And I can re- recall, Denise certainly would have had to do this, and I have it as well. You'd have to hold her. But not, you know, this kind of affectionate hold. This was more of a like, I'm pinning you down hold. You know what I'm saying? Okay, don't don't call CP. She's 21 now, okay? But, uh, but, but, uh, you know, you have to cut her legs between your leg and hold her here. And you just got to kind of pin her down. And you have to hold her until she would just wear herself. Because she was just in a rage. And and this would happen on on a semi-regular basis. And what we would do is we'd hold her. At least I would. I would go, and Denise would probably do something similar. But we'd hold her and I'd just whisper in her ear. And, and, and I've tried to let this be what I would say to her because there were other times that, you know, things were coming out of my own mouth that I'm like, oh, you know, you, just, you say things because you're frustrated. But, but when I was in my right mind, I would, I would hold her and I'd pin her down in a sense. I'd be like, I love you so much, but we're not going to do this. I love you. I love, I, I was really saying it for my own benefit. I was honestly, I was trying to remind myself, you love this little girl. You know what I'm saying? So there's something about the love of God connected to the discipline of God, the, the, the justice and the righteousness of God. They're not to be separated from his love. And so when we think about, for God so loved the world, there's something so important for us to remember is that God indeed can love us and does love us, even though he calls us to a place of righteousness. Let's get back into this verse for just a second. Get back into this verse, John 3, 16. Just for a moment, I want to spend a little time on this. For God loved the world so much. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. God loves us specifically. Specifically. Now, I, I, I'm considering the phrase, for God loved the world, when I think of that. For God loved the world. And you, you in your mind's eye, you may think to yourself, well, preacher... That actually doesn't sound very specific. It sounds actually very general, very generic. You may think that the term world isn't very specific, but I believe God was making a very radical statement when he had those words, obviously spoken in the scriptures. You know, the Jewish mindset at the time was very myopic. It was very closed. It was us and and no one else. The idea that a savior was coming and the idea that a Messiah was coming and was going to be the king of the Jews and and was going to come and and save his people. In the mindset of a Jew, this was their way of thinking, we're the end all be all. There is no one outside of us. They could barely conceptualize a planet with other people. Because to their view, it was just them. The idea of the Messiah was coming for them. And this is why they had such a hard time. If you ever read in the New Testament and thought to yourself, why are the Jews having such a hard time now that the Gentiles are coming to faith? 
Gentiles are non-Jews. Why is it that this was such a big deal to them that Gentiles were coming to salvation? It's because they didn't think this message was for them. It was just for themselves. And so when the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world, what an amazingly radical statement. It didn't say, for God so loved the Jews. No, God so loved the world. Friends, God's love is never, has never been, and will never be limited to a certain group. It's never been limited. We have to work very hard to understand this, though. Because in our mindset, uh, mind, uh, mindset we, we, are, we think a lot of times like the Jews. You know, we put a little veneer over it, we clean it up a little bit, and we think to ourselves, well, the love of God's obviously for me, and it's for my friends, it's for my family, it's for other good people. And we may not outright say it right out of our mouth, but we have this belief structure that God's love can't be for them. They're so messed up. It can't be for them. They don't get it. They'll never get it. And we like to make these checklists, don't we? Like who gets God's love and who doesn't get it? But that's a list that we have to be very careful with because it applies to us. Why? Because we are the world. Should I sing that to you right now? Right? <laughs> We are the world. And God's love came to us, even though we were a mess. This becomes so clear, I think, in the Gospels. As you look at the Gospels, all the way through the, the, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to hear of stories, and there's a narrative, and there's this kind of running set of themes that go throughout the Gospels that help illustrate how the love of God came for us. And we're never to exclude it from anyone else. It's for the world, for God's love of the world. And there's two key illustrations that we read of in the scripture. The first has to do with sheep and the second has to do with sparrows. Sheep and sparrows. Let's talk about sheep for a second. Uh, give me a, uh, the sound of a sheep here. I'm, I'm, how, okay, thank you. That was very good. All right. I wanted to see just how foolish you would look doing that. Okay, so uh, sheep. Not the smartest of animals, obviously. Uh, they wander off a lot. Uh, I've said it before that they nibble their way to lostness. Okay? It's been said that um, sin will, will do a couple things. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it'll cost you more than you want to pay. And we're those sheep that just kind of put our head down and we nibble our way into the deep, deep weeds, into lostness, in sin and in shame. And, and the Bible actually refers to us as sheep. Jesus says this in John chapter 10. He says, I'm the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me and I will lay down my life for the sheep. Friends, he's laid down his life for us. He's laid down his life for us even though we're bad, the bad sheep. He'll lay down his life for those of us that have been mean to each other. We've been picking at each other. He loves us even when we turn our back on him. Even when we nibble our way to lostness. Friends, we're these kind of sheep, and I think the illustration just keeps going on and on and on. We, we can be oh so soft and, and, and simple and, and docile at times, but we can be extraordinarily dumb. And we're those kind of people that the good shepherd says, I came for you. I'll lay my life down for you. Not because of what you've done, not because of how great you are, but because of how much I love you. Go all the way back to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 7 says, God wasn't attracted to you and didn't choose you because you were big and important. In fact, there was almost nothing about you. He did it out of sheer love, keeping the promise that he made to your ancestors. Friends, God loves us, not because of us, but because of his love. And, and when we think about the love of God and the goodness of God to go after us, and, and, and then we compare it to our goodness, friends, our goodness is nothing. Our goodness can never win God's love. Our badness can never lose God's love. His love just keeps going on and on and on, like the song we just sang. It's so deep, and it washes over me. His love is so deep. And we could try to resist it, but friends, why? Why resist the love of the Lord? Just give in to it. It's being expressed to us so vividly and so powerfully and being expressed to the entire world, and that includes us. So we see that in the picture of the sheep, the babas, right? 
Well, what about the sparrows? Let's just, uh, what is a, how would a sparrow sound? Um, caw, caw, I don't know, uh, like that. Maybe that's not it, but close. All right, well, the Bible says this in Matthew 10. It's verse 29, it says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. Aren't two sparrows sold for one penny? Huh. Corey, re- help remind me of this. So two for one. Are you with me, bro? Two sparrows for one penny. Tell it back to me so you can remember. Two sparrows for one penny. Got that? Hold on to that because it's going to get confusing in just a second. Because then I was reading over in Luke. In Luke chapter 12, it's verses 6 and 7. Jesus says this. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? And yet not one of them is forgotten. Not one of them falls before God. Indeed, the very hairs in your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You're more valuable than many sparrows. Uh, Stephen, uh, help me out here. Five sparrows for, what does it say? Two cents. Where, what do we have over here? Two for one. How many? This seems like a discrepancy, doesn't it? Right? And some of you would say this. Well, that's, there it is. There's proof. The Bible. The Bible is not the authoritative word of God. I can't figure that stuff out. No, no, no. It's just different individuals writing down their, their remembrances, the stories that were told. They're capturing as best as they can under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I believe this is actually evidence of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Why do I believe that? Because you've got two varying texts saying two different things. Corey saying what? Two for one. one. Stephen, what? Five for two. Two Two for one, five for two. Here's the point under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Sparrows are cheap. (laughs) They're cheap. It's biblical junk food. You can just go into the market, buy, just, just you know, hit, lay down a bucket, just get a bunch of them. They'd use them for sacrifices there in the temple. I don't know what else they would use them for, but regardless, they are cheap. And here's the point that we have, I think. If God loves these cheap sparrows so much that he knows every one of them that falls to the ground and dies, how much more does he love us? How much more does he love us? For God loved the world, not just the Jews, but he opened it up for everyone. And he knows every one of us. He knows the hairs on your head. That, that's easy for some of you, okay? For others, not so easy, but he knows everything about you and loves you anyway. Whether it be the sparrows or these dumb sheep that nibble the way to lostness, we know God Loved the world. He loves us specifically. He also loves us sacrificially. That scripture goes on to say, for God loved the world so much. So much. I can remember tucking our kids in at night, and Denise has done the same, where sometimes we'd tuck them in, and I'd say, I love you so much. And kind of just tickle in their belly. I love you so much. How how much is that? How many O's are on that so? If we were to try to write it out, you know, maybe we'd put 10, maybe 12 O's on that so. But when you talk about the love of God, the sacrificial love of God, there's an infinite amount of O's on that so. It just keeps on going. 1 John chapter 3 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. See what great love the Father has so lavished on us that he would call us the children of God. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't go cheap. It's extravagant. Years ago, somebody gave us, Denise and I, a a gift for one of our children. It was when they were infants. They gave them an outfit and and you know how you do when you get an outfit from someone and you look at it and you smile and you're like, thank you so much. This is wonderful. This is great. And then everyone leaves and you look at it again. And you're like, what? What are we going to do with this? You know, don't judge me. We've all done this, right? Okay. So they had a gift receipt in there and we took it back to the store that they had gotten it from. We walked up to the return department. We said, we just need to return this. It just doesn't, this isn't working for us. And 
she punched into the computer, and she goes, okay, we'll give you a refund. Oh, how much is it? And we're thinking we'll go back and go find something else in the store. She gave us, if I remember the story correctly, she gave us 17 cents back. 17 cents is what we got back on that. That's what they paid for that item was 17 cents. And I thought to myself, wow, wow, that was extravagant. (laughs) No, it was just the opposite. Friends, you see, when we think about how we give to one another, so often we withhold, so often we go with the lowest common denominator, so often we play it cheap. But what we see with God is that he lavished upon us by giving us the love of not only the Father, but the gift of the Son sacrificially laid down. No greater love has any person ever shown than he would lay down his life for us. Friends, it's embarrassing sometimes how much God loves us. It's embarrassing. And not just me, but everyone else in this room. I want to finish by just saying this to you. Today, if you walked into this room and wondered if you were loved, I hope that everything we've said today just confirms you are absolutely, unequivocally loved of God. The Father is so for you. There might be others of you today that you've done stuff over the last few weeks or maybe last night or the thoughts you've had that you would think to yourself, there's no way. The things I've done that have so disappointed the Lord, I'm sure that that was the last straw. Friends, there is no last straw. Some of you may think, well, I've already exhausted the second chances of God. Then you get the third chance, and the fourth chance, and the fifth chance, and it just keeps going. You may say, well, preacher, it sounds like you're just letting their grace run free, and that that the love of God would be cheapened. No, 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 no. I don't think we can ever do that. I don't think we can cheapen it. It's extravagant. It's lavished upon us. Now, friends, Lest we ever be the kind of people that would say, well, I can do whatever I want because God will just keep loving me. No, that's not the heart. Romans deals with that. We don't want to just keep on sinning just because grace abounds. We want to live a righteous life. But we need to understand that regardless of what you've done, God will still love you. Come back to him. Just come back to him. Some of you today are running. You're running from the Lord. Oh, sure, you're here in this place, but in your heart, you're running. I don't invite you to come back to the Lord today. Let's pray.